Hey, what's up, everybody? Hey, what's up, Ben? Both Ben's. Magic City Brewing Company down at the Casket Salesman. And a high wire double high pitch IPA. That's what the Ben's are drinking. I'm just finishing up a uh, Market Garden uh, Stout. I actually got a mixed six pack from Giant Eagle today. I was out of, since there haven't been any farmers markets, I was running out of food and they had them, the mixed six pack thing. And there's a bunch of, uh, or a few Christmas beers I wanted to try, but I didn't want a six pack of. So it was great. They had a, a number of them in there. And that's, this is the one I have next. It's a dill pickle sour from Urban Artifact. Uh, and again, that's not something I want to try a six pack of, but I want to taste. In normal times, you know, I would just get a glass of that somewhere. Some of the other um, ones I got. I got some normal Christmas ales that are typical to around here. Thirsty Dogs, 12 Dogs at Christmas. and But then there are a couple um, Tafts from Cincinnati had an interesting sounded one. It has orange in it. So, yeah, so it was a nice way that I'm going to get to try some of the Christmas beers without having to buy a bunch of six packs of beers that I'm not sure I'm going to really like. Like this, I've had a pickle beer before. This is a pickle goza, and it was... It was decent, but again, one one or two is the most I would want. Watch your face. <laughs> Anyways, um, since I've been doing this, there's been a lot of people, or a lot relative to the size of this channel who have joined, and so I haven't really talked about why I do live streams. Um, now they're really fun. We have some people chatting, but I started off basically doing it to teach myself how to live stream in case any of my clients actually asked me how to do it so that was a big deal I was influenced a ton by um, Terry Berenson who started doing a morning routine live stream almost every day during lockdown he's a photographer videographer and then a cycling youtuber and his stuff's great so that's kind of been that's kind of what I'm doing it started off just I wanted to know how everything worked you know use my professional camera with my laptop and my audio recorder and all kinds of stuff and get it to work and now that it is working and we have a little crew here, it's always fun to do. And then it's fun to come down here and mess around with my bikes. And when I say mess around, I mean I spend about six hours running cables over three episodes. And we mostly just drink beer and talk about Rehoboth Beach. So, yeah. <laughs> Cook with pickle beer, huh? Yeah. You've had the pickle beer, Ben? Yeah, I'm interested to try it. I don't know if I should have drank a stout before switching to a pickle beer, but... I guess a stout's kind of a good palate cleanser. You know, it's not like drinking something hoppy that's going to skew your taste buds. So, yeah, the Barry Hoven's pretty much done, except for, you know, Otis thought that brake reach might be a problem when I get 32 millimeter tires on there, the bike we've been building over, what, a month and a half. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so that that's set to go. And so I thought I'd get back into... This look, which before the Barry Hoban was sitting on the stand forever, Otis, who was on a week ago, the mechanic at Dirt, or the owner of Dirty River, um, when I was originally building this, he ran the um, internally routed uh, rear brake cable for me. But uh, yeah, I kind of have everything else put together. I just wanted his help with that. I'll probably need someone's help down the road because it's a campy group set and I know nothing about campy. Um, actually using it i've never had any of their stuff so i think it's 10 speed centaur centaur however you whatever the italian would be which i think is like kind of their 105 i'm guessing since it's campy though it's probably even better than that i don't think campy has really made anything that's garbage i mean i know there's people who aren't fans of them but i think almost all their stuff is fairly high quality and then uh some mavic wheels they're actually a tour de france models which is kind of cool we got the yellow spoke, but it's cool because this is a Bernardino look, and he won the Tour de France five times. So kind of fitting. Some French wheels, French frame, Italian group set. Uh, the first thing I want to do is switch out the stem. I just put this on here because it's sitting around here. No, I mean, not a horrible stem. It's a, uh, I, I don't know how you pronounce it, Nito or Nitto, but, um, but not right for this bike, obviously. Yeah, I need to get into this pickle beer.
Oh, that is Pickly. That is no joke. Huh. You could add this to a Bloody Mary and, you know, like how we sometimes put, we had Bloody Marys on Christmas morning, me, uh, Akron, Ben, and Aaron, and she had, she added some pickle juice with the pickles. Man, you could... It's different. It's kind of refreshing, but then it starts refreshing, but then ends with like the salt saltiness of a goza, but then mixed with pickles. Interesting. I'll see how it goes after it's more than just a couple sips. So Nitto, it's pronounced Nitto. Uh, ben says, "Hey, what's up, Alan?" It's so funny because now with YouTube, now I watch more bike content on YouTube, and so I do as long as people are pronouncing stuff right on their channels, have a better understanding of what stuff said. But it's like when you only ever read about stuff, it's kind of like camera gear. I, I watch some YouTube videos, or a lot of YouTube videos about camera stuff. But I started off just by reading everything when I was learning and reading about bikes, reading about cameras, so it didn't have a lot of conversation. So like pronunciations that are wrong have gotten stuck in my head, or I just never knew the correct ones. So, yeah. This is the bike that we were joking with Otis too, that Yonda, who is a mechanic at a shop, joked because it's vintage carbon. If it ever starts to feel a little bit comfortable to stop immediately because something's broken. But I could only imagine how stiff it is. The cool thing is though that it actually, which really surprises me, will clear 32s. So that'll actually build in some compliance in the tires. I mean, I can't imagine running this, I'm sure People who, when this was first built up, were running like 23s on it, which would just probably be a pretty brutal ride. I also got this Aero um, seat post. I bought it on eBay for this bike. And then I got some uh, some All City pedals that'll look cool on it. I'll run this with cages. But got these at Dirty River as well. Get that focus. Yeah. So I thought that the chrome and black would fit the whole look of this. The look of this. Does do people know who Bernardino is? He was a, um, like I said, five-time Tour de France winner. Always in the conversation of greatest of all time. You know, if not, he's pretty close to Merckx. But yeah, really interesting. Seems like stereotypical Frenchman. Like, hate to say that, but would be what the stereotype is and if you are interested in racing or just even you know bikes at all like there's a great documentary on him versus greg lamont called slaying the badger that you should look up i know amazon prime's got it i'm not sure what other services have it i'm sure someone's bootlegged it onto youtube um but it's awesome and it's kind of the team uh la Vie claire split down the middle which was the team that wrote looks and basically bernardino had won the tour de france one year and kind of said to Lamond, if he helped him win, then he would work for him the next year. And then the next year, he kind of didn't do that and went back on his word. And they ended up kind of the team was competing with it of itself. Kind of a little bit what's going on with Ineos these days, Team Sky, um, with so many Grand Tour contenders, or was kind of happening. I know they all gave a good public face about it, but there's no way that, you know, those guys weren't, a um, few of them weren't out for themselves. But yeah, so I guess I'll pull this. I, I need to get, I haven't messed with these. I need to remember where you take campy levers off from. If it's like the Shimano or it's more like the Scram. I think it's like Shimano. You come in from the front, but it's the top instead of the side. Isn't it? Yeah, it's right there. I guess I should. Ooh, pickles. Yeah, next week on New Year's, or next week, next, on Thursday, I think we're going to work on Aaron's Bombora some more over at her house. Have a, I think we're going to go down to Dirty River and get the rest of the parts she needs. And so I think we're going to do that at 8 o'clock again instead of waiting till 9. Oh, yeah. 
Yep, that's it. Oh, I remember this. this. These are kind of those like ergonomic bars that have the little bump there for your hand, which I like, but it was hard to get the bars over, or the levers over. I do not want to accidentally undo these all the way. I don't, I don't know if campy levers are like vintage levers, but whenever I pulled this little bolt out completely on vintage levers, like arrow levers, it's been really hard to get it back in. I want to go just loose enough and not over loose. That is not the most convenient way to loosen a lever, but toe straps that kind of keep this from losing all its cables. Will this work? I think it will. Am I still all right on the stream? Am I still all right on the stream? I'm not. Let's see. Got my, uh, wireless mouse over here so I could actually work from this side. Yeah, it shows it's running good too. Right. It feels weird doing this on my own again since I've had, what, Otis over here then with Aaron and Ben last week. Post-COVID, it would be fun to always do this with the guest. We do need to figure out the Zoom thing. It'd be fun to interview some of you guys. Get Ben from Columbus on since he knows a thousand times more about bikes than me. I guess it'd make more sense to have my face in here. Huh? And I guess I got lucky with the Allen wrench guess on this because I didn't even. I think older. I think I remember looking up when I was originally putting these on, which has been a long time now, that older campy levers, or is it newer ones, had to use a Torx bit? They don't even use the um, standard Allen size. Which seems more in line with what an Italian higher-end Italian company would do, something totally off the wall. And I'm struggling with this one. Can't keep it in there. Is anybody watching? Uh, I pulled it out all the way, god damn it. Well, 
Oh, good. It's all integrated. It's not going to be too big of a pain, it doesn't look like. Is anyone watching that ride anything campy? I mean, most of us have gravel bikes now, and that's not something that's going to come standard, I don't think, on many. All right, good. I got that bad. No, I didn't get it back in. <laughs> Might crack the carbon if I over tighten the strap. Nice. I think I had a delay in the chat, but yeah. Ah, so new higher end bike stuff is going Torx bits or Torx bits so people don't over tighten it. Nice. I'm a Shimano guy. Um, you know, I I kind of have a question. I think that the two Bens might know. So I was watching a uh, lanky cyclist, you know, who pops in here sometimes and does other YouTube reviews. He was reviewing his Surly Wednesday. Um, and it's a, it's a video from, I think a few months ago, but I just watched it, uh, like last night and he was talking about his rear derailleur on it. Well, it's only got a rear derailleur. And I think he said it was Eagle something like lower end Eagle. I don't, I don't know, SRAM, SRAM, cause I am a Shimano guy, but he was talking about how leggy the shifting was like he shifted and it was a few pedal turns before it would shift. So I asked him, I'm like, are you sure it's set up right? But then I saw other comments and people were like, yeah, it's like that. I'm like, it's like that. Like, you know, a trail bike to have like that much delay and shifting uh, seems awful. And like, I totally understand that high end stuff wouldn't do that. But I'm just thinking about my 01 Trek mountain bike that's Shimano Dior and how the rear derailleur still shifts into place like almost flawlessly on a beat up old drivetrain. So I was wondering if anyone knows, is there something with some of that? Did SRAM have some bad rear derailleurs? Like, are just their lower end stuff not that great? I don't know. That seemed weird to me. Um, that any modern, that any modern uh, rear derailleurs would not be able to shift smoothly. I mean, micro shift makes stuff that shifts smoothly, right? For almost nothing. That's a real pain in the ass. Is that it? Yeah, on group sets, like, I think it's cool to have a campy on. Campy group set on this, I'm excited to try out, like, the thumb shifting and stuff, and, but... Again, this is kind of like a bike for fun. I got the frame pretty cheap. I think it was like 150 bucks and then plus shipping from France. And so I just thought it was kind of cool, a Bernardino vintage carbon bike, and I just kind of got it to get it. And then as the other parts came together, I'm like, oh, I might as well build it up and ride it. So I traded for the campy group set. My friend Stu, who actually is a musician and repairs, repairs pianos right down from Dirty River Bicycle Works, um, traded me for the campy group set. My friend Kevin Butler, who has a carbon component company called 226, which I meant to link below because I knew I was going to bring him up, uh, sold me the wheel set for a pretty good deal. Or we might have even traded for that. I've traded him for a number of things. The 105 group set that is on the Barry Hoban came from him too. But yeah, so once these parts started to come together, I'm like, these are all perfect for this bike. So I'm like, might as well build this thing up. This is a this is a beat up toe strap. 
which is probably why it's not on anything. There we go. Uh, oh, hi, Ian. Um, Scott says he's riding a CAD 9 hand mainframe in the U.S. Upgraded 25 mil tires, <laughs> looking at a gravel bike. Yeah, we all used to ride, or, well, some of us used to ride fairly skinny tires, and over time, it's just like, and I will put the widest tires my bikes fit, you know, like, so this bike that it fits 32 is awesome. My gravel bike is only a 42 because it's a 2014, so before they started adding more clearance. But I ride 32s on all my road bikes except my Schwinn, which is kind of my fast bike. That bike pretty much tops out at 28s, but again, that's a bike I only ride when I know I'm going to hit like fairly smooth pavement, you know. Plus, it needs to be on smooth pavement because I have those Bontrager race light wheels and they probably any abuse and they would shred they don't have a great up reputation yeah so ben's saying that uh, when they build a wednesday they have smooth shifting i'm wondering if then maybe it's just there's something that he needs to get adjusted on that because it doesn't seem right to me that like like i said i mean i might if we're all in a conversation conversation like joke around because i just do like shimano but I can't imagine that SRAM's putting out stuff that would be, you know, that wouldn't be shifting well in this day and age, you know. What do I need to pull? Oh, I need to take the bars off. Oh, this is an old school. This is just a bolt. Could it happen to be this size that I have right here? Of course not. <laughs> CAD fits uh, max 25 in the front and 28 in the rear. Yeah, I always, I'm always amazed when I watch like, you know, GCN being the big guys, but they're, they talk about their winter tires and like putting 28s on. But to me, a, a British winter is nothing like a winter here in, you know, well, Northeast Ohio or the Midwest in general. But uh, yeah, to me, a winter tire being a 28 is crazy. But our, also, I don't, I don't know, maybe, you know, I'm not someone who drives my, very rare for me to put my bike in my car and go somewhere i'm riding from here and our streets are just rough and uh just for me to get to akron like where the shop is even uh the one big bridge i have to go over the little cuyahoga valley and like that is all like where the bike lane is is like these grooves for like drainage and so it's just like man after getting myself beat up originally on tires some of my vintage bikes came on it's like this will fit 32s i'm putting 32s on it but now a lot of times even for road rides, if I know some of the spots we're going, especially in winter when it's dark and I can't see the roads with our potholes, like I'm just gonna jump on my gravel bike. You know, it's 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 roady enough for me um, most of the time. I'm not a racer or anything either, granted. Let me grab something for this old stem. You can see it's just like that old. I can't see from there, but it's literally a bolt on the back. Oh, hey, what's up, Linky? We were just talking about your Wednesday. I, since I just watched that video yesterday. Oh, all right. Bigger than a nine, smaller than a ten. Wait, what? Ours is a six. That's a six. <laughs> no, wait. No, it's not. 
Wait, what the hell? Oh, I went the wrong way. I'm talking, I'm chatting, and I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing. Oh, this might be standard, right? Did the Japanese use standard or metric? Now that I think about it. Oh, 12. Yep, 12 box wrench. Is anyone else who joined later? We talked about what we were drinking early on. Drinking anything good? Drinking any beers or mixed drinks or hot tea? Sunday and Monday were hot tea for me as I'm trying to cut back a little bit after this crazy year. I think I've... I mean, I always drink too much, but definitely this year have been even more so. Is there a tip for this? I always feel like, I, with, especially with the vintage bars, I just struggle with trying to get the bars out of the um, stem all the time. Like they're not scratched up, so I must have got it. I got them in there <laughs> without too much trouble. I wonder if I spread that a little with something. Williams having cookies, cookies and cream ice cream. Nice. <laughs> I cannot get this past the point. Nope. Done. If I got that in there, it's got to be able to come out, right? As always, if you haven't been here before, I am not a uh, bike mechanic. <laughs> I'm a bike hobbyist who likes to mess around with stuff and then consult the experts when I'm stuck. Like, these bars are stuck. I can't get around the curve of the drop starts to drop, I just can't get it out of there. I don't want to scratch them up that bad. Oh, it looks like I scratched them up a good deal getting them. It's on this side, I didn't see it. So I did scratch them up a good deal getting them in there. 
get a thick screwdriver and try and spread that. Spreading it. There we go. What are the bars? They are. Oh, these are three T as well. So I hope I got the right size stem. I believe I did, but I should probably double check before I install that, huh? Oh yeah, this is the uh, so I thought that would look pretty sweet on this bike. It's like a hot dog down a hall. <laughs> Huh, this has like a secondary set screw. I've never, what is that for? Let's see. Can you make that out? See how there's like a little set screw right there? Do I need to do anything with that? Or is that just to keep this little bushing from slipping out? if there's any movement here. Oh, Lanky's drinking a Shiner Holiday Cheer. I've had those. It's been a long time since I've had a Shiner Holiday Cheer, though. I'm wondering if that little... Yeah. Yeah, it's moving, so I don't, that set screw must be for the bushing, but it almost looks like it's going into the, yeah, it moves, it moved, Wait, is this going to fit? Because this gets wider here. I thought I was careful to order the right size, but who knows. That's not going to come close, getting 10 Tensioning the stem bolt to keep it from backing out, yeah. And I can't imagine I own Allen's that size to test it, but I feel like it's moving with the screwdriver, so I don't feel like it's actually... I liked how on Tuesday after Otis fixed up my um, Barry Hoban build, how 
he sat down and he said, now what did we learn? <laughs> and went through every single thing that I had done wrong. But it's kind of cool to have someone to do that. Wow, that is... That is one thing I will take about a modern uh, stem. I prefer quill stems, but the way you can just take the plate completely off is definitely a better system. Twenty five point four on that tiny little uh let's just pull this out completely. No so yeah. See what see what it does. I like the idea of the bushing in there, though. That's, I mean, it kind of makes sense to have. This is something where I need a, where a third hand would help. <laughs> Give not even on camera. <laughs> oh, you think you used to help spread the stem? That's what that, like I should turn that now? Backwards? Uh oh. Am I? That's backwards? Oh. This way, right? <laughs> Let me see if I can get my brain. Yeah. So that way. Oh yeah, that would've been great if I went through all that effort and didn't even get it on the right way. <laughs> uh, how not how not to build bikes with Tim Fitzwater. How to build bikes with help from a bunch of your friends with Tim Fitzwater. Oh, well, we're closer. One more bend to go to find out it's the wrong size. <laughs> no, maybe it is the wrong size. <laughs> no, good. It's got to go on there. Awesome. <laughs> three T is three T Italian. Yep, made in Italy. So I've got two Italian things that hopefully will end up going together.
Oh, now I gotta get that bushing back in place. If you weren't watching before, there's like a rubber bushing in this uh, stem. And if you weren't watching before, I'm drinking a pickle beer. I was about to ask where my screwdriver was. It's like, Now I need a thinner flat head for this part of the operation. Oh, there we go. Oh yeah, this headset is Mavic. It's a little marred, so I could tell whoever messed with it last to probably sell this frame. Did not have the Mavic headset tool, and I've yet to talk to anyone who does. Um, so. Definitely a unique, different item. Weren't we talking on one of these uh, episodes about Mavic's electronic group set? I think it was, was it called the Zap? Zap, right? It had some name that was very like, funny uh, electronic sounding. I think they tried to make a professional team ride on it. It was kind of a disaster. And what, I think in the, was it in the 80s? Early 90s? That's loose, that should come out. Oh yeah, funny story about this uh, Fitzwater photo t-shirt. If you can't tell it is, it's because when I first started a Teespring store before I made it public, I made a few designs and I thought this dark on dark looked kind of cool and in their like little mock-up they show you, it looked awesome. And then so I ordered samples of each before I would, you know, obviously try and sell it to anyone. And it actually looks better here on camera because it's catching the bright lights I have set up. But like out in the day, you cannot see the Fitzwater photography at all it's just these like focus things around it so like I saw that and I'm like take this down just in case anyone stumbles across this uh, zap yeah Mavic zap this this logo that completely failed so the ones that are up now are uh, fine Mavic's interesting if you've, I don't know if anyone's followed the news about them, but it turns out that the people who were actually working at the company didn't know who owned it, and it actually slipped into, I think, bankruptcy, and they didn't know who the owners were, and it turned out it was some investment firm, I think somewhere in the U.S., and I think it was actually Bernardino who just like a few months ago invested personal money to help it with other people to helping buy the company back from 
it was owned by these various letter, levels of corporate bureaucracy, you know, whatever. Hey, what's up, Danny? Uh, Scott asks, what's better for gravel bikes, steel or aluminum? Steel is real. I got a steel gravel bike. I'm, I'm fast on it. I don't think steel is too heavy to make a good gravel bike. It depends on what kind of steel you use. That's Reynolds 853, which isn't their lightest, but the compliance is nice. But, uh... I don't know. I mean, if you're gravel racing, that's a different story, you know, and having an arrow, almost a cross bike or whatever, but I don't know. I've still got a couple KOMs on that bike. I don't think carbon would have made me that much faster. Hold that headset with something. Read in the chat here. Yeah, I saw some of your clips, Danny, or but probably more of those were from yesterday. You should link your uh, Instagram, Danny, since you have a totally different name on there. If you want, if you want people to be following it. I might need to take this out of the stand. I can't get this freaking thing the last little bit out. can't loosen it, it's already loosened all the way. I put it in so it's not frozen in there. There we go. Oh, it didn't loosen all the way here. I mean, I guess the issue with carbon anything, it, I mean, it's worth it if you could afford it. And I mean, if, if money's not an object to you, it's worth it. Uh, I don't mean it like that. But I mean, you know, I think nice carbon, nice carbon wheels for gravel are worth it. You know, something, you know, spinning light wheels makes sense. They're worth it if that's within your budget. It's not worth it to me compared to the other stuff I need to own in my life, I don't feel like the performance I would gain would make it totally worth it. Like when I do a gravel, even when I do a gravel race, I'm not, I'm not in the lead pack. I'm not even winning my age group. Um, so worth it. I mean, what are we talking? You know, what would a few minutes over like a super climby hard gravel course? I don't know. But all those decisions, I'm, it would never be to knock it. Like, I mean, looks, looks new gravel bike. That's all carbon, and I think comes with carbon wheels. Looks awesome to me. But again, that's not something I would spend that much money on. But if you have it, why not? Yeah, carbon's disposable. Uh, that's the other problem. That's the only carbon thing I have, but uh, we'll accept these. I showed them last week, these shitty SLK cranks that completely broke on me. They came on my uh, Neo Retro Schwinn build and they completely, I was riding my bike and then all of a sudden this was down here and my feet were next to each other. But 
that's not because of the carbon. It's just a horrible design that never should have been sold. And the carbon bars I had on there are... There was an error of carbon that was garbage, right? When everyone wanted to be uh, Lance Armstrong, they were putting out all this crappy carbon. These are those... Uh, well, I had more than one mechanic tell me, you keep riding these bars, you're going to end up needing a lot of uh, teeth work done eventually. So, obviously it's way better now. But yeah, I bought that. It's a Schwinn Peloton Columbus SLX frame. But this guy had put all the most like dangerous carbon components from uh, that era on there. Well, from later than the bike, but the, the real Lancey era. Like those, they're not carbon, but even the race light wheels, which are known to fail. So. Yeah, I've seen people repair carbon, but you got to know what you're doing. I mean, I mean, you got to know what you're doing to weld steel, but. Titanium, got to get a TI for him. Well, I think, you know, Modern carbon now, they build in all the like expensive handmade carbon, they build in all this compliance now on purpose. Um, this bike, there's no way this is more comfortable than a steel frame <laughs> of the same vintage or any of my vintage bikes. This thing is going to be a, you know, like I said, if I couldn't fit 32s on here, this thing would, would crush you. Old carbon was like old aluminum. They've gotten better with aluminum too, like getting compliance into aluminum. But like my Trek 1500 there on the trainer, when that's a 2007 when I was riding that bike on the road it was a brutal ride um, there's no there's no doubt about it that had 28s I think that's the max that bike can clear and but now they've gotten a lot better at that so if you're a weight weenie and you want a light bike um, they do have compliance in carbon now but if weight isn't your number one concern I mean steel is always going to be comfortable to you know You've got a large scar on your bar. Uh, ben says he's got a large scar on his left arm from Easton EC90 bars in the 90s. Yeah, I can't believe how many people warned me about those. And then, then when I rode it a couple more times and I was starting to feel that little bend that they have in them, because I guess it's all separate pieces that they put together to get all those shapes, which I really like the shape of those bars. They were super comfortable. And I mentioned it before, but I got nine speed Durace on that bike, which I love. It's like butter. And the levers fit really well and everything, but yeah. What did you have to say? Titanium? I heard someone call titanium the heaviest of the light metals, which I think is a funny, funny way to put it. What is, I, I've watched stuff on it before, but I can't remember. What's the compliance on titanium supposed to be like? Is it compliance? Is it supposed to like be closer to steel than... You know it is to aluminum or carbon or <laughs> titanium is like a z job if you have to ask you can't afford it um i mean there's again you have to compare apples to apples but it seems like you could look at a lot of titanium bikes that are cheaper than a similarly spec carbon bike Uh, what was the minimum on this? Does it have a mark? It's got it. I mean, I might as well slam this bike. It's got like the long negative drop, but oh, there it is. All right. Oh yeah, that looks so much better. Same titanium is like a leaf spring. 
But right, it's heavier than aluminum. It's just lighter than steel, I believe. Wasn't there a whole thing about... Um, did GCN do this, that someone came up with a cheaper way? No, that was magnesium. Because there were those magnesium frames back in the day, but magnesium will shatter. And they just did a video, or didn't just do it, it's been a year or two, but on how someone's come up with a new magnesium process and there's supposed to be some new magnesium bikes out there. Can't remember now where I was going with that. Which you guys, anyone who's here regularly, is quite used to. <laughs> Nineteen hundred frame fourth. Yonda says compliance is a factor of design. Titanium bikes can be made either way, really depending on wall thickness and tube profiles. Yeah, I mean, I guess you know. Yeah, yeah, like anything, carbon layup is very important. There's no layup here. This is these are tubes glued into aluminum lugs and it's going to be stiff as hell but you know a modern endurance carbon road bike can have a comfortable ride you know so i guess that's true of anything right even steel the grade of steel the how the budding on the steel you know what is that what is like a so who's the one company in California that just does titanium? Moot? Isn't that Moot? What does a Moot frame set cost? Are those, are those up in the high-end carbon realm? I thought they were... I know they're pricey, but... Yeah, no, it's great, too, that all the lawyers and doctors like want to buy all that expensive stuff because then it sits in their garage for a couple of years and we could get it on the used market, right? But I'm not... I'm, I'm probably underbiked in most of my situations, but like I said, I'm not a racer, so I just, it doesn't really matter. I just, I like stuff that looks cool. Like I said, I love my Trek, my vintage Trek with nine speed 105. I've toured across the state on it twice, and you know, I've got 4,000 miles on it. And my Rally Tamland 2 as my gravel bike, with now I have, I've upgraded that to 11 speed Shimano 105, which I think is a brilliant group set. It's the range is awesome. Uh, yeah, I don't. And if you have the money, there's nothing wrong with riding nice stuff and buying decent stuff. I mean, you know, one of the things for me is like when I look at stuff like hydraulic disc brakes, which I know would be better, and electronic groove sets, which I know would be better, I couldn't work on them. Um, all right, I could learn to, but it'd be a pain. If something breaks, it's a pain. If something breaks on the trail with hydraulic, what do you do to fix that? You know, so there's some... There's some simple stuff like, you know, it's obviously a road bike, but, you know, rim brakes are so easy to adjust. You're multi-tool, you're going to be able to fix it, you know. Um, I don't know. I just, I, I, we were just watching me and Ben on Christmas, an interview with the Alter Dynamico guys, uh, and how, uh, is it Ronnie? He goes by like a hundred names, but the one who's on the West, or I mean on the East Coast. And he was just talking about that, how he used to be super serious and super into it and the, the gear and doing intervals and all that. And now that he rides for fun, he prefers, you know, like a Rivendale with rim brakes or I don't know if he said Rivendale, but something like along those lines. And to me, that's a little bit more of my attitude. Like for my gravel bike, it is, they are cable disc brakes. That's one where I upgraded to 11 speed because I want a bike that can do everything kind of and just work and the stuff works on it. Um, the other bikes I could tinker with, and I, yeah, I've got multiple bikes, so something's always going to be working for the most part. <laughs> Are moots really expensive? Uh, some bigger production moots frames might be 3K. So more expensive. Yeah, I guess I've never really looked into the price. Um, who else were we just looking at? Did All City just come out with a limited edition titanium bike? Is that what we were just looking at? 
Colorado was moots. Four to five K. Yeah. All right. See you, Danny. Thanks for stopping by. Yeah, I guess, you know, when I go into Dirty River, I'm always looking at the price tags because since I'm never really in the new frame market, I am pretty clueless on what stuff costs, except like, you know, I know what the high-end pro bikes cost just because I watch pro racing. So it's like, that's in my world. So people, if you, if I'm watching race news on GCN or whatever, it may be flow sports, like watching the tour, this stuff's going to be talked about, but like. I can't off the top of my head tell you what any all city or surly costs and when I watch like videos like lanky cyclists or whoever then I'm like I get the idea or when like someone buys a new all city from the shop like then maybe I'll be like oh what did that cost but it's not stuff that like sticks in my brain so just because it's not my market I like modifying old stuff but Uh, Salsa has TI frames. Maybe that's, maybe it's, I knew I was thinking of a QBP company. It's something we were just looking at, so it must be that Salsa. Carver. I've never heard of Carver. I've heard of Fire, well, we've talked about Firefly. I think we were talking about that with Otis last Tuesday. Must have been looking at a Salsa. I'm trying to think of, oh yeah, because, well, it wasn't the original the original Warbird was a TI frame, right? No, I'm saying TI because I'm reading it instead of titanium. Salsa does their Fargo and their Drop Our Mountain Bike in titanium frame option, but sold as a frame alone. I'll have to look up Carver at Yonda. I'm not, I'm actually not familiar with them at all. I'll tighten this a little bit, then put it on the ground to get the position right. Oh, Yanda, you weren't here uh, last Tuesday. Do you have a right-hand drill that would fit in to drill out the bridge on my um, Barry Hoven frame? Because I couldn't fit, obviously couldn't fit my drill in there, which I didn't think about till I got it all together and ready. Warbird was aluminum. Yeah, I just thought they had a titanium version like their original one was. I could be totally wrong. I...
drill it all the way through. I we were talking about that, and there's a reason that Otis said we should not do that, and it might be specific to the bridge on that bike, which is kind of unique. It's flat, not concave, but I there was a reason he said not to drill that bridge all the way through. You know someone local with a titanium warbird? Yeah, 2015, that's what I thought, because I, I know it's around the time of my Tamlan when they were both kind of like becoming more gravel-specific bikes, you know. You can get a 90-degree drill if I need it. I do need it. Air-powered? Aaron has a compressor, so I could, I could drill that at Aaron's. There, there was a reason, specific reason, that we weren't drilling that bridge all the way through. So 2015, yeah, so. Two topics, titanium warbirds and a vintage steel bike that I need to modify to take modern brakes. They have multiple grooves in here for the cable routing options, but they couldn't find a groove for the uh, Allen wrench and how you have to tighten these things down. For this one needs to be it's not a loner that's fine yeah I just it's kind of the final thing I to me it looks like those brakes on the Barry Hoven are hitting the brake track I would have said I'm gonna run into clearance problems with the 32s and they need to be put on different I don't know you could look at it. I mean, not that I don't trust him. He knows a thousand times more than me, but. Does this cable even cut the, why is this? This housing. I don't know, even know I have this on here. Try wrench, yeah, I know. I should, I need to upgrade some of my bike tools since I mess with stuff so much. I've done that with some things, but yeah, still. And then when we were over at Aaron's house, using hers that are actually the park tool, um, hex Allen wrenches that have the balls are so much like those little, like, I don't know what you call them, but the ball shape at the end, so you don't have to get it. That would be super beneficial on this where I'm trying to push through the hood from two ways to not have to have the angle completely straight. Let's get this. Make sure that's compressionless. How much room do I want? Looking at my other bikes to see where I want how much. Ball and wrench, yeah. <laughs> yeah, those balls feel good in your hands.
you're watching this later, I can't even repeat these jokes. I don't have any I don't have any response for these comments. <laughs> Grab some ends for these. can't find my little end, box of ends for my housings. Thanks, Lanky. Thanks for stopping by. Look forward to your next videos. And like we said before, when we could actually all meet in person. A little thing of campy parts that... I should probably make sure this is even. Yeah, we're good. One on this one. Uh, is this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. One other thing we were talking about is this bike doesn't have the. Um, the frame set didn't have the cable routing piece for the bottom. I got grabbed one from Dirty River, and then the it's not threaded. And I looked inside when I had the bottom bracket pulled apart of how it would have been like maybe bolted in there. But fair rules. But me and Yande, and he said that he thinks using some double sided tape and then just putting this on there because the pressure of the cables. Should keep it in place, so that's going to be a going to test that out. Yeah, where are my ferrules? For reals? That's the problem with working on bikes, talking to people, and being buzzed is that I don't remember where I put my stuff. Well, that's an excuse for the, uh, it's an excuse for the, uh, bike building problems I have. Am I out? I mean, I mean, I would have had them originally. For real? For real? Oh. What's in this little... I save like every little gl glass jar. It feels like just a little area over here is like when you go to an estate sale where some someone who's probably 90 passed away and it's all cool jars full of like nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. And now I have little glass jars full of stuff that came off vintage bikes that I, I, at some point might be useful, but I'll never know what they, uh, you know, like what they were or were for probably in most, most likely scenario. I'm okay.
Oh, here we go. You know, your random uh, chain links. You know, got to have at least, you got to have at least 20 Schrader valve covers or are you even, are you even living? Can't argue with that being a fun fact. There's one. Ah, there's my blue pressed a valve cover. Yeah, this is a great, this is a great little container. A couple real vintage. Uh... Let's see. Some washers, got a couple loose ball bearings in here. That was an interesting part from a probably vintage cable housing. A little lock ring. Wonder what I forgot to put that back on. Let's see. <laughs> hmm, another gripper nut. Wasn't Otis trying to find more of those last week? Ah, oh, there's two of those lock rings in here, so that makes me feel better. That can is empty, William, you, you are right. Did you ever ride track bikes, uh, Ben? Columbus pedal pusher? I think the only time I ever... Uh, can't remember if I tr tried Akron. I don't think it was Akron Ben's night uh, because... He rides considerably smaller bikes than me. I think it was our friend Michael who moved to up near Toronto. I think I rode his. Um, his was a, I think it was a, was it a vintage Swin that he he converted into a fixie, so not a track frame but a fixie. I remember just riding it around the parking lot and just my reflexes as soon as I was going around a curve to try and pull that inside pedal up and then to keep going just felt so strange. But that's I think that's the only time I've even attempted to ride. Anything track bike like this are not the right size. I've got one. Like I've said before, I used to watch a lot of that stuff on YouTube, but yeah. Never owned any track bike. What is the thing now, too? It seems like a lot of YouTubers I watch, if you call a track bike or even just a fixed gear bike, no matter how it was built, a fixie, people seem like offended. I feel like when the guy I bought this building off of, I brought up, I don't know much about jazz, and I brought up something about a certain record, and I was like, is that what they call fusion? And we were, this was in text, and he was like angry. And I'm like, I didn't know it had a connotation, and I feel the same way about fixie lately. If you say fixie, like I'm gonna get corrected to track bike all the time, like, or, Like when someone calls the musical genre of hip hop rap, I hate that rap stuff. That's probably what I sound like, right? Ben had an old Phillips converted to fixed, then a steamroller. 
after a city bus hit me on the Phillips and destroyed it. Uh, I thought I cut this. Did I put the wrong housing on? Couldn't have been that far off. <laughs> ben, ben said if someone gets butt hurt over the word fixie, stop talking to them about bikes. Yeah, I. Phew. That's what everyone called them. I, oh, yeah, I did put the wrong. I mean, I get there's some things in life you're not knowledgeable about, like, and you need to be corrected on, and I just don't feel like that's one of them. I don't mean you, I mean me. You know, my dad calling people Orientals, that's something to be like, hey, you know, we really don't say that. Oh, we don't say that anymore? Ah, uh, no, we were never supposed to say that your generation just did anyway you know i don't think fixie is up there with that <laughs> yeah the other thing is i'm just simply from akron ohio there's not a um there's not a bike messenger culture. There's not a track culture. There's neither. So I, I mean, all right. Now it's looking good. It's still a little long. Oh. Let's get another one of these, uh, another one of these beers. This is the one I wanted to try. Um, I don't know, Ben. Do you ever go to Cincinnati? This is a uh, Taps. It's a their brewery is amazing. It's in um, it's in an old church, and they did this awesome job where you could sit in the upper balconies in these little like comfortable spots, or the bar is up where the altar would have been <laughs> or church knowledge and just tables around and then they even have a basement where there probably was I don't know, whatever that would have been and I sit in an old Catholic church I don't know but it's awesome brewery the beer and food are good I'm trying to think if me and Ben and Aaron went there the first year we did to Ohio to Erie and got to Cincinnati I think we did have a beer there not sure if we ate there um, I've been there with Aaron on a different Cincinnati trip so it's a little clouded then I did a professional photo shoot down in Cincinnati and um, it was over a weekend and we stopped in there also, but really cool spot. But this is a winter sweet orange ale, which is something I've never heard of and there's no description. And again, since I was able to get a mix six and just try one, figured it might be something good. I'm 
might mean it might need more uh for rolls yeah and if i can't find more but i found enough for this side The ones I have are for different size having. <laughs> so I have a, like I said, this bike was a project I started a long time ago and set it aside. Now I'm trying, did I have a piece of housing cut for this? I should make sure this is the right. Yeah, it's compression. Uh, Campagnolo, Campagnolo Ultra Friction Size. <laughs> yeah, did... Oh, this is Shifter. Yeah. Yeah, so I must have a bunch of brake ones and not any Shifter. Italian Shifter Size. Yeah, these are all too big. Oh, I just went black. Can you guys not see me? Put a new battery in the DSLR. Oh, it's not a DSLR, it's a new one. I can't see that on this part. Of there we go. Has my audio recorder been blocking that frame the whole time? That's a pretty rookie mistake. It's 10 speed campy if that means anything. Wait, Ben, you said you caved and traded the old Hero 2? The mains? What does that mean? Also, let's get this out of frame. It looks like it's bouncing, right? If you're talking about the audio. <laughs> Turn up the mains. Oh, good. This isn't. I thought it's going to be overly sweet. Winter sweet orange ale. It is sweet, but it's not. It doesn't kill you on the finish. Hmm. And Yonder, you don't need to run over here at ten thirty at night. This is not like a critical, you know. 
critical uh, project. There's no pads in the brick. <laughs> Yonder, we don't know all your inside jokes, man. Give us a break. Oh, you did get the nine. Nice. I missed that. Um, sweet. $100 trading credit. It doesn't take like anything, right? I think when I bought my GoPro Hero 8, I sent them like, you know, I people give me camera stuff all the time. And to get the $100 off, you had to send them a camera that was worth like, I can't remember, but I remember looking up like a bunch of cameras that I had, not cool film cameras, like shitty digital cameras that were in a box with a couple cool film items. And yeah, I got that $100 off on the 8 by doing that, shipping in some garbage Canon power shot from 19, oh, probably early 2000s. And then what the other way to get a hundred dollars off is I was Terry B was talking about this Terry Baron said on his live stream this morning he has the nine but he you get a hundred dollars off if you sign up for their cloud service which he was saying he didn't care about but then he realized that you also get discounts deep discounts on like deep I don't know decent discounts on all the other GoPro stuff so since he uses a bunch of other GoPro stuff like he got the media mod so he can plug in like his audio stuff um, like wireless mics and when he does like his following behind people and he can have a mic and what else he got the media oh and the um the nine also has that extra lens that you could switch to for like a wider perspective so he said it already paid off to do a hundred dollars and sign up for that because he saved money on other stuff so even if he has to pay for the membership next year it'll still be worth it with the gopro shit If you want to swing by, Yonda, I mean, I'm here drinking a beer. I'm having like the nine envy, like, but I know the eight is good enough for what I do right now. So I'm just like, I just want to wait another year. Like GoPro puts them out every year. So they upgrade every single fall. So I'm like, skip the nine. You don't need it. It is a nice upgrade. It has a bigger sensor. So I'm guessing it's finally a little better in low light. I know it's not great, but it's a little better, which is a big deal. But the big, the big thing about the nine is that like um, horizon leveling. I've watched people test it where they're like, they're letting it swing almost on like a, I wouldn't even know. Like there's one video where Terry just has it hanging around his neck on something. And he's riding down the street in New York and you can't even tell because they went to that um, 5K sensor and basically what they do is crop in so the image circle has room to spin around and still be in 4K. And it's just absolutely unbelievable. And I only shoot my GoPro 8 in 2K. And when I upload to YouTube, I upload it into 4K. Or I, when I export it out of Premiere, I export it out into 4K. And that, like the software do those calculations so I have a smaller file size to work with. So I can, you know, I can imagine shooting that GoPro in a smaller size and it would be even better. So that's a really cool feature about it. And um, also if you mount it on like uh, handlebars that have a um, slant to it. So now with the GoPro, even the eight or I had the five before, um, if you do that, you know, you have that crooked horizon whereas the nine can automatically level that even if you don't have the GoPro level, which is a, big issue there's times where you'd want to turn that off there's times where you want you know feel like when we're riding the gnarly off-road trails like um, Honda Hills or some what we call the salt flats I think you would you would want to just use the stabilization because you want to show people kind of what you know how far you're leaning and all that kind of stuff but for other things it sounds like it would be so awesome mountain biking snowboarding I don't do that but people who do extreme sports it's got to look really cool on Yeah, definitely want to see what yours looks like, Ben, and try it out. 
Yeah, what does GoPro do with all those old cameras? I don't think they, I don't know. It seems like every GoPro is made to be $100 off. I don't get it. And it's just like they're like, you're going to have to jump through a hoop or two. I mean, having you sign up for their cloud service, because if you started using it, makes sense, because that's something they're going to make money on. The old camera thing, I, I can't imagine what they're doing. Like, old electronics have no value. And I mean, like, even if you're going to tear them down and get, like, precious metals out of something like cheap old cameras don't have any of that like what part does a gopro 2 have that gopro can now reuse for a 9 i can't imagine there's anything in there like that is reusable the sensors no no the sizes are all different like the 9's even a totally different size than the 8 so say even i send in my 8 next year to get a hundred dollars off or whatever uh, which i probably wouldn't do with the 8 because it's a good camera but Again, like what would the value to them be of that? Because it's not even compatible with any else. So the body itself isn't compatible. I, I have no idea why they do that. Yeah, warranty referred, but it doesn't have to be a GoPro camera you send in. They'll like take like anything. Like, like I said, I send in like some old Canon or some Olympus thing that was sitting around. It's like, there is no, nobody is trying to turn that thing in for anything anymore, right? Uh, but a GoPro Hero 2, like Ben sent in, like, there's nobody still trying to deal with that camera, you know? Like, I would say anything back beyond the five, there's probably nobody there dealing with. You know, if you send them, like, I guess maybe it is that people don't own cameras, like, the way I do or going back far enough. So maybe they are getting a lot of six and sevens when they do a deal like this and it makes it worth it that they don't specify that because maybe I'm in like the 1% that sends them garbage digital cameras from 2003. So maybe you're right, Ben, I could be. Yeah. You know, they're keeping you out of DJI because DJI has the Osmo. That was pretty close. be interesting to see if they're going to upgrade that because, you know, that was the DJI's camera was one that went head-to-head -head with the GoPro Hero 8, and I considered it. I was looking at both, and then I'm like, I know GoPro. All the reviews were putting them pretty close and giving an edge to the stabilization, the hyper smooth on the GoPro 8. And I'm like, that's kind of why I'm upgrading is to get the uh, smoothness. So, um yeah, I'll be really curious to see what DJI does with their next one, if it's going to be... Because when it comes to drone world, like DJI is the only name, and I've talked about this a bunch on here, but you're, if you're going to get a drone, and when people ask me, uh, what drone should I get? I'm like, what's your budget? What are you trying to do with it? And then I tell them the DJI model of drone to get. So I feel like they could really take it to the next level. Instead, they put out that new pocket, or maybe that's what they call the Osmo, which is, to me, not, it's like a vlogging camera. It would have no use. There's no way I would use it for cycling. It's like a little gimbal. It's like, just give me the electronic stabilization for that. Brand loyalty? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I'll be interested to see, too, what the, um, just with the bigger sensor, too. I know they did that for, like I said, the stabilization and the horizon leveling. But if there is more quality, because that's kind of been one of the things with GoPros for a while is even as they've upgraded, like the quality improvements are pretty incremental, which in video isn't a huge deal. In action video, it's not what you're paying attention to. But with the bigger sensor, it'd be nice to see a step up in actual image quality, dynamic range, you know. Um, the 8 does, like I said, the 8 is pretty impressive, but those are still really small sensors, you know, and they're they're pretty limited and it's it's not so much the footage you just get out of the camera has a problem it's when you're in a tough situation and you want to in post processing like push it or pull it one way or the other you don't have a lot of leeway with gopro footage like with my canon when i want to mess with the video footage you know if i'm like when i'm filming one of these like that's not live like when i'm standing here talking about something the leeway i have to color grade and balance out the you know push the blacks down without them getting really gritty and, you know, drop the highlights to bring tones back in my face if I want to use my bright lights is impressive. And I don't expect a GoPro 
to have the sensor of a four thousand dollar top of the line cannon but it's something that i just wish they would i'm glad they got the stabilization to be killer now let's start to get the image quality just a little bit better would be cool you know longer battery life the new ones do have a new bigger battery and the eight had a better battery than the seven they switched you could use the ones going back i could use my gopro 5 batteries in the 8 but the 8 batteries that were specific for it were better and yeah some way to i don't know what that would be but also how the cold kills gopros you watch all this like they like market these things for snowboarders and all that but you know the cold really kills my 8 really fast like i said i keep an extra battery um in a warm pocket when i'm out riding but you forget about it sometimes and if i just hook it on my pants like i do in the summer and it's in like 25 degree in the wind it'll it'll die pretty quick even when it's not being used turned off it'll be losing power the whole time i mean that's the thing with lithium batteries batteries period but there has to be like they're waterproof that just feel like it could be insulated or they could bump that battery life it's a bigger gopro so there should be bigger space for the bigger battery but i yeah i never I mean, there's no camera gear that I would only ever carry one battery for, even when the weather's nice, you know. And I with the GoPro, which will be annoying when I do upgrade to this, whether it be the 9, the 10, or whatever, um, since they did switch batteries, it won't work. But I have one of the um, their little dual, it's a USB Type-C, and it charges two batteries at once, which is nice. And when we do, like, the longer bike tours, I'll bring the Hero 5 batteries just as backup. So, like, two for the 8. And I'll bring two of the five batteries with me just in case I were to mess up a charging or one goes bad. And as you saw, like just with my R5 dying here while I was doing the live stream, you know, I had another battery sitting here, but I have four more upstairs. And this camera, like, I mean, obviously live streaming and just letting it run is going to drain a battery. But even for photography, these mirrorless cameras just kill batteries. Like compared to my like the camera that's replaced my 5D Mark IV, like I rarely ever switched a battery during like a three hour event that I could be shooting and even even like switch it over to video for a couple quick things. This, anything I do, like a portrait session, I'm like watching the battery meter go down. It's something with mirrorless they're gonna have to get a handle on. I, I know you could put a battery grip on it. I don't want to. One of the convenient things is that it's a smaller camera, so I carry a lot of extras, but. Yeah, I know. It's so dumb. So it says, or just the ability to tether a charging block to them without removing the door. It's one of the things they did, I think, starting with the 8, or maybe starting with the 7. I think it was the 8, where they put the, um, the charging port and the memory card and everything under one door. And the door just basically, when you open the door, I don't even just try and open the door in the GoPro. It just comes off. It's basically you remove the door. Oh, Yonda's here. Yeah, it's really frustrating because you could charge a GoPro, but then they're not waterproof. They're not, you have to worry about the memory card and the battery falling out and all that. Let me go let them in. So, yeah, I have no, this, this laptop is having some problem playing video, so I can't even throw something on. I'll just be right back with them. We're back. I don't know what 
size than me though. This looks like four. Say hi to all the. Uh, What's up? This is Yonda in the flesh. Is this the compressions? Yeah, that's three. Oh, that, these are five. The black ones are four. Yeah. I wasn't sure, so I grabbed both. Have you messed with this kind of grip set at all? It's been a while. Oh, all the way back to the six where they put that stupid. Oh, yeah, that's it. Four? Yeah. I my boss at Performance had a bike with this on it. That's the last time I did a hang up. This kind of thing. Yeah, see how they have the dual routing options too? Yeah, SRAM does that. Oh, it does? Yeah. yeah. Did I cut this? I can't remember now. Hang on, SRAM. It looks pretty close. Oh, come on, this one is. Hmm. Or two one. Yeah. Are you, are you going over the top with it? No, it's got the groove here on the bars, oh, right? So. Yeah. I usually try and pair them up so that you get a nice flat spot. What's up, Rick? I usually try and pair up brake and shift like that so you can keep them tight so, to each So other. should I pair them up around the front instead yeah. of doing the one around the back? Yeah, because they come out weird on the back. It pulls on the bar tape weird. You can get a gentler loop on the front. Oh, okay. So is this housing still going to work that way then? Yeah, it should it's still show. Yeah, that's what should be like. Mm -hmm. Oh, original fancy housing is still. Yeah. I would grab you some shift cables if I knew you were going to use. I have. I actually have brand new ones, but Otis yeah. looked at those and said they were fine. Well, how are you going to get that through a piece of housing? Well, I didn't see it was like that. <laughs> <laughs> You have good cutters. You can cut it. Yeah, you have good cutters. I have cutters in the car. Oh, these are good. You know, if they're too short, you pull them out and just start again. Oh, he said, "What's going on here?" Uh, ben said, "Tell Jan I'm flipping them off." <laughs> ben from Columbus said, "Just BSing and building up an old look carbon bike." Yeah, uh, Bernardito KG seventy six. So vintage French bike, 10 speed campy group set, Mavic. How do you pronounce that? Kaiserium? Cerium. Kaiserium. No, no, no K at all. Cerium. Cerium? Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> they threw the K in there to confuse. I do love your joke that if this bike ever feels comfortable to stop riding immediately. <laughs> What do you mean? Otis did. Well, he did him. <laughs> he routed this wrong. Front brake always goes out from the front by itself. Oh, if the shift cable is across it, then I did it wrong. No, the rear brake cable is across it. You got a threesome hanging out here somewhere? What's a threesome? Three-way wrench. <laughs> what size do you need? Five, Five. or eight? When you take the week off. Oh, you yeah, haven't been working all week? No. Otis said I had time off I had to use. Uh, Ralph. What a nice boss. He gives you guys time off. Otis doesn't watch this. We don't have to kick his ass to kick his ass. <laughs> short on front housing here, bud. Do I have any more? Front, front brake. Well, that's just brake cables, right? Brake, yeah. 
I thought they had fully new. It's not campy branded though. It's not. <laughs> I, thought that, I thought that said campy on it. No, it says Jaguar. Oh. And campy is slightly different in their cables and housing, right? Uh, the heads on the ship cables are different, and sometimes. So the housing so, shouldn't matter as much. No. Yeah, this is too short. <laughs> so on the what's a threesome, Ben said, Google image search will get you on track. <laughs> 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 Too busy. Oh, yeah. That's why I have that little, it turns out to be like the perfect little angle there to set stuff down. Let's see. you a drink but I only have beer. These would actually, these look bikes, wasn't there one carbon company that actually made most of the carbon bikes in this era? Mm. Or did they just make the tubes kind of like Columbus does? I'm trying to think of the name. And Giant I was making like everything for a long time, but that was pretty much when Monocot came on the scene. Oh yeah, there was, there was an earlier company that 80s, uh, Probably some Italian composite company. Yeah. Makes, you know, Formula One shit. And everybody trusted them. Like, oh, you make cars go fast. Yeah, I think one of the big deals with this frame, too, is that I got it cheap. It's like right between. It's not vintage enough to be cool, you know? So it's. Well, once it's vintage enough to be cool, it won't exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be shattered in a million pieces. It'll make great wall art by then, but yeah. I thought that was for the. This is for the housing, and that was for the cables. Not on stranded. Ah. Or compression less linear, whatever you want to call it. Sirota? Didn't Sirota make all steel bikes? Did they ever? I don't know. Everybody I know that's ever owned a Sirota was a huge dickhead, so I made a point of avoiding it. Sirota <laughs> made uh, those Huffy branded uh, 7 Eleven, Team 7 Eleven bikes for a while before they were. But either before or after. Ask, uh, the guy I used to work with, Curtis. Um, I said I need somebody with a Ty Warburg. Hmm. That's who it is. He, uh, he's a frame builder and wants other fun frames, but old shit is very knowledgeable on. Now, it wasn't one of the big frame building companies, talking to them in chat, that made the um, carbon bikes that a lot of brands rebranded as their own. It was a company. I think it was a composites company out of. I think you're right. It was a composites company, not a cycling company. Yeah. 
east and did a lot of tubing, a lot of carbon stuff. I have a couple carbon, vintage carbon groups on Facebook because I own this test. That's when I was trying to figure out exactly what year and how it was set up originally. Believe it or not, I think this was a um, Shimano build. Because it's not an, it's like, it's a little French, lower. They have no loyalties. What? I said they're French, they have no loyalties. Yeah. The only groups I've been they don't work anymore, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Electronic Mavic. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about that zap. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, Simplex made some really nice stuff. They just used that plastic that went bad with age. So at the time, and for pros, it was fine. But the Jaton I have came with all decent Simplex shifters, but they weren't. You got decent electrical tape. Yeah. I decent by your standards. I don't know. I have electrical tape. <laughs> no, this is garbage. What's decent electrical tape? 3M Super 33. What? 3M Super 33. Uh, did you guys know that? 3M Super 33 It doesn't get sticky on the outside. Yeah. Like this that I'm riding on my unbar tape trainer. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was riding that today. I took my gloves off because I got so hot. And it's, yeah, just like a mess. Yeah, tape a customer's bike with that. See what happens. They get shit all over their hands. Come back super happy. <laughs> ben said they don't even know how to pronounce a damn K. <laughs> <laughs> it's going back to the French comments. That's a, this is more modern, so it's standard, but like the vintage French, bike, French bikes, they're trying to do the Neo Retro build on the Jeton, how everything's just slightly different. Uh, yeah. The threads in the bottom bracket are different. Well, at that time... <laughs> Bottom bracket, like BSA, was truly British, a British standard. So, other, it hadn't really become like a true standard. Oh, are these levers, even, are we running these without even having them? Work, or? I thought, <laughs> you do that shit before you put the cables in. <laughs> 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 This one is, you're gonna match this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, we're gonna tilt the bars to make it work right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's pretty this close. This is pretty good, like yeah. this angle here. Yeah, Enough yeah. that you can move it and not worry about the tape. Yeah. Well, yeah, right? Well, I mean, as long as the angle of the dangle is directly proportional to the heat of the meat. Yeah. <laughs> What the fuck are you saving these for? I'm not saving them so much as I've just started throwing them up there when I pull them <laughs> off something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't even know what those. Premium rubber here, folks. Premium rubber. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. Take a piece home with you. <laughs> Golden Boys. That's Stay gold, pony boy. <laughs> that's when they made them. That's when they knew how to make them. Oh, these are 27s, one and a quarter. Straighter valve and everything. Wow. Golden boys. Wow. <laughs> wow. You got a dime sized section of rubber missing out of the side of the wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put about 30 PSI in that, and it'll explode yeah. and kill you. <laughs> yeah, I think my more reasonable tires are over on this side. Those are just like all the vintage. Like, you wouldn't want to say, get rid of them because of retail value, of course. Yeah, well, you never know. The rubber market is always it's very volatile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody's talking about this graphene, but yeah, no. vintage rubber is the next thing. As soon as that market pops, you are going to be on top of it. Yeah, that works, right? Yeah, I think that'll work because around the back you're gonna end up with like this weird curve. Yeah. Or in the front because when it goes around this way, it's gonna bend it even sharper. Which isn't this? Yeah, that's how I got there. 
if you want to be able to get to 90 degrees and not rip the cables out. Yeah. So when the bike falls over the gas station, <laughs> it still shifts when you get back on it. Would you say that is is this about like what their 105 equivalent group set is? And uh, yeah, at the time it would have been like a. Well, I mean, at this point in time, any any of the thing, anything Camper made looked better than almost anything Shimano was making. <laughs> so. But at this point in time, 105 was nine speed. Yeah. Oh, so it's already, yeah. So, but everything campy was all, you know, it's one, it goes one more. Yeah, he gave me two different, two different uh, cassettes with it, too. Hey, and these will love that one. That's why I put the, yeah. That's the wide range? I think that's the wide range. <laughs> Maybe not. Oh no, this is a much wider range. Yeah. What's the widest on this? That gotta be like a 28? Yeah. Was there two different cage lengths or others? Because that's a pretty short cage for a 28. Yeah. Which is maybe why you had to switch it. Maybe I don't. There might have been a medium length, medium cage centaur. Yeah. Uh, rear derailleur, and he didn't have it. Got that cassette thinking that he could cheat it. And uh, yeah. That makes sense. But I mean, it's campy, so everything can change. Like if you were to find a broken derailleur, but the cage wasn't damaged, like a medium cage, you could change just the cage. Oh really? Yeah. Because, I mean, kept relatively clean, you know, not in the salt and stuff. This group saw a lot last the bike. Well, yeah. And this is going to be a low mile bike. I mean, yeah, but I'm saying even if one day it is, it is wall art and you find something else to put campy on, and wide range is what you want to do, just keep an eBay watch for a medium <laughs> centaur cage. You find one for seven bucks. Yeah. Have you ever ridden it with the the thumb shifting? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've ridden record and super record before. Oh, really? Yeah. When I was at Broadway, we did a lot of campy stuff. Not I guess long. I've just never hung out with the roadies. I mean, it's the only that. place I ever did campy stuff. Yeah. yeah. Not hanging out with roadies, you never you just don't come across it on vintage stuff. We yeah. also sold like ten thousand dollar commuter bikes, hmm. like once. <laughs> Titanium. <laughs> heaviest titanium bike I ever built was a guy's winter beater with a roll off hub 29 pound <laughs> titanium bike that was $9,500 he said if that bike falls over it's going to break anyway so the other cassette is 9 to 12 <laughs> <laughs> what is this gazelle weigh? I haven't weighed this bike uh, the heaviest thing on it are probably the wheels but well, the wheels aren't really all that heavy. They're supposed to be, yeah, even the ones for the time. Shit. They yeah. were pretty light. I mean, they're the SLs. Yeah, I think it's gonna. It'll be a pretty light bike. It won't be light by, you know. But it's. I mean, you shouldn't have a problem getting it near twenty pounds. Yeah. I mean, it's the bottom bracket's probably your heavy. Yeah. Like. And the only way to, to really beat that would be a, a Phil Wood with a titanium spindle. Yeah, and the one, I had, I did have an issue, and I emailed some guys who knew it, who were like French experts and have a website they talk about, because I... Is this a French thread? Yeah, so I left the Mavic bottom bracket in, and I asked them if there would be any problem with the spindles, and they said they didn't think so, because this is the campy one that goes with the group set. But, but is that an Italian thread? Yeah. No, it's a... Let's see. Now I can't remember the details of what was wrong. Well, maybe ISO versus GIS. Yeah, that might be what it is. Taper. Which, 
I mean, a Mavic bottom bracket should it, probably ISO, but if this bike came, if it was originally spec Japanese, then you, there is a problem with the taper. Hmm. Which is, I mean, it looks like it's fully seated, but and it, it is if you ride it once and the crank arm's still loose, stop riding it because you'll round out the crank. In which case, your only option is going to be solo. Because they make... The basically, their fit. bottom brackets are in pieces. Yeah. So you buy French cups, you buy the ISO spindle, and then your dealer's choice on fairing. The standard or the carbonite, which is what Han Solo was frozen in. So, shit's gotta be good. <laughs> this is This is from France. Like, I bought it from France, so it's not a U.S. market bike. Yeah, but I'm saying, if this bike... When it was built as a complete bike, started as Shimano, it's going to be a JIS, Japanese Industrial Standard, taper. Mm. There's two different square tapers. There's yeah. ISO, which is International Standards Organization, which is Europe. And then there's JIS, which as of current is the standard, which is Japanese Industrial Standard. But everything now, unless it's some weirdo crank set that they made ISO just to be a pain in the ass, everything now is JIS. Yeah, I, and that's one of the things I can't remember. When I was putting it together originally, I had some concerns, and I know I did email and talk to people about what I was doing, but now I don't remember those details. Yeah, and off the top of my head, I don't remember. I know there's, you can go one way and not the other. Sheldon will know. Yeah. It's listed on Sheldon's website. So, like, it's either ISO cranks will fit on a JIS taper or JIS cranks will fit on an ISO taper. It's, it's one or the other, and I don't remember. So if I want to keep it light, bring only one GoPro battery. <laughs> <laughs> ben said I'm a French expert, if you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> like French made or French toast, I'm on board either way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's first like all. Somebody's got good taste. Oh. That was my Christmas present from Ben. Uh, ben also got me one of those when my daughter was born. He knows how to buy them. You got him the black one? Motherfucker. <laughs> I was with him when he bought yours up at <laughs> yeah. Joy Machines. We rode our bikes up there. These are the best. A lot of sustain. You, you could go, you could have a bite to eat and come back. Still be <laughs> Showed this last week. That. Oh yeah, I was busy with Home Invader. Well, now you could hear it. <laughs> home Invaders. My freaking father-in-law. Uh, I didn't do any Christmas stuff. Hanging out with Ben and Aaron was it. I mean, he was the only person I had, but I saw everybody else standing out in the garage freezing our asses off. <laughs> like, you stay over there. We'll stay over here. Put everything in the middle. I'll also be fast with these bladed arrow spokes. So. Oh, so fast. Cut through the wind. Plus, I mean, squirrels, chipmunks, anything small, just... Yep. Next some... on the live stream, will it blend? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I know? One thing I do want eventually, too, and I know everyone says you should. Those, uh... Yeah, how do you pronounce Spinergy wheels? The four-spoke, uh... Do you remember those carbon wheels? Oh, Spinergy was uh, Kevlar fiberglass spokes. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think they did the four spoke. You're, you're talking about heads. Now, the Spinergy did, oh, it was, what, it was like eight, but it was it was four. It no, it was, like, like, four. it was like 14 or, or 16 spokes. They had those, but, but they, they had like, a full bladed, just. Uh, uh, maybe like, in, in just a carbon. Yeah. Yeah, Spinergy's big thing was those floppy spokes. What were those like? I mean, it's just a Kevlar thread, basically. Oh. So they have like a plastic casing over them, but they're a Kevlar thread spoke, basically. Oh. They're popular in wheelchairs still. That's, I think, the only reason Spinergy's still in business. Oh, I didn't even know they were still in business. Yeah, because they don't, they really don't go out of true. They're just heavy. Hmm. But you can beat the shit out of them. So... 
Yeah, my, my best friend's an engineer for uh, Indicare, Top End, in Florida. So they do a lot of, well, they do a, oh, mostly wheelchairs, but oh, I have a, hand cycles and all that stuff. I have an aunt who works for them uh, in Florida. In Florida? Yeah. Yeah, that's where her dad is. I miss Sheldon. He was such a good dude. Really glad I got to meet him a few times. Oh, you got to meet Sheldon? Huh. Son of a bitch. Yonda has a picture of Sheldon over his work bench. Laminated. Lam, lam, well laminated. <laughs> <laughs> ben said they have a Mavic spoke wrench. Oh, is that what, is this a unique? Yeah, see how they're splined? Yeah. They look cool. They're cool looking. Yeah. Cool looking wheels. Yeah, like so you'll probably want to keep up with putting a little drop of triflow on these. Ah. Because the, the nipple threads into the rim. So if those threads get stuck, the whole wheel's garbage. Oh, gotcha. And it's aluminum on aluminum, so they like to get stuck. Good to know. Because the nipple's made onto the spoke. Oh, really? Yeah, so the, the other end of that is basically smashed over. And the, the nipple pushes on the end of that spoke while it's pulling on the rim. So when you when you buy a spoke, there's a nipple on it. Hmm. I did look up the Tour de France models with the that logo on the hub and the yellow spoke. Yeah. And they're exactly the same as the regular ones, except they have that decal and the yellow spoke. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure they sold tons of them too. Put limited edition on there, and dude, we sold these at Performance when I worked there eleven years ago. <laughs> People were, we'd get like three or four sets of them, and people go crazy for them. Call you, AJ from Acton Coffee. As soon as I brought him up, he was like, he's like, are those the ones where they're machined out? He was like, man, those are the hot shit. And he had a look. He had a um, he had a Bernardino, an earlier one, but he could only. It only cleared like 25s. Otis sold him a tire and it was actually rubbing on the uh, C tube. That's why he ended up buying that All City Mr. Pink. We need to stick to strong bikes. What's that? We need to stick yeah. to strong bikes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what he said. Uh, yeah. 32 to Spinergy did a four-spoke carbon wheel originally to compete with Spin's three-spoke wheels in the 90s. And then he said his shop in Newton was near my college girlfriend's apartment, so that's about Sheldon. Oh, where's, yeah. New where's Sheldon from? Where's Newton? Uh, I don't know. East Coast somewhere, I thought. Oh. I have no idea where he's from. I actually know his website from buying the vintage bikes, and when you Google stuff, that's what yeah, comes up. What and comes that's up. how I got to know who he was. Yeah. But, yeah, it's from this stuff. Well, I appreciate it. No uh, problem. So I only need one of the black ones, then? Yeah, you can keep the bag. <laughs> yeah. You want the silver ones back? Nope. I got buckets of them. Well, I threw them in a dime bag and said, here you go. That way, next time you're looking at it, you just know it's find a dime bag. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, man. Well, have fun. Do you, well, hang on one second. Yeah. Alright, dudes, I'm going to take off and then I'm going to see Yonda out. So, very abrupt, but Thursday, 8 o'clock, New Year's Eve party. Peace out, guys.